Hello viewers, and welcome to the latest installment of the LOTR LCG Progression Series, a production by Cardboard of the Rings, the bi-weekly podcast about the Lord of the Rings, the card game, which is a living card game by Fantasy Flight Games. This is Mitch. And I'm Matthew. And today we're going to be taking a look at the new hero and player cards of the Hobbit Underhill and Overhill Saga expansion. So Matthew, why don't you go ahead and start us off? The first hero that we'll be discussing is Thorin Oakenshield. He is a leadership hero with a threat cost of 12, 3 willpower, 3 attack strength, 1 defense strength, and 5 hit points. He's a dwarf, he's noble, he's a warrior, and if you control at least 5 dwarf characters, add 1 additional resource to Thorin Oakenshield's pool when you collect resources during the resource phase. Let me just sort of start with something that's completely unrelated to LOTR LCG, and that is by saying that as a kid... Thorn Oakenshield was my favorite character, and so whenever I would play an RPG or anything like that, I always named my character Thorin, and to this day, that's actually still the case. So if I ever create a character name, his name is Thorin. So totally loved this guy, was so excited for his hero card to come out, and on top of it, he's pretty darn good, I, I think, as he very well should be. So in a sense, I think Thorin is our second dwarf leader, of course, Dane Ironfoot being the first. And he's one threat higher than Dane, and he has better stats than Dane, which of course is why he has the one extra threat. So I like his ability in that it's very thematic. You have to control quite a few number of dwarves, sort of building up your Thorin and company. And if you're not using Dane, I think this is a nice way to sort of compensate for losing that extra willpower because you're pumping out more resources, which means you can play more dwarf allies. So I definitely think that Thorin Oakenshield has absolutely spectacular stats. So long as one character has Dane Ironfoot on the table, he begins the game with four willpower, which rivals Eowyn. Another interesting aspect to Thorin Oakenshield is that not only is he a very valuable questing character, but since he's got that printed three attack strength again, so long as Dane is on the table, he has the highest base attack value of any hero in the game that we've seen thus far. Although he is trumped by the tactics hero that we'll get to a little bit later in this video. He has a very low defense value, but since you're likely going to be using him for attacking or questing, his big pool of hit points makes him a great recipient for undefended attacks. You did touch on the fact that he has a very high threat value, especially if you're running Dane Ironfoot, but that resource acceleration ability can just help you to get a host of powerful leadership dwarves into play, like the Longbeard Orc Slayer or the Longbeard Elder. And as we've covered in countless other videos, there are just a host of effects that bolster Thorin's questing and combat capability to an even greater level than it already is. Really, the big trick about Thorin Oakenshield is that you want to make use of a couple of his different attributes. So not only is he a powerful combat character, but he's also fantastic, so attacking for four and committing to the quest for four. So if you're using effects like Lure of Moria to ensure that he's ready, or Unexpected Courage, possibly even Erebor Record Keeper, which itself, being a cheap dwarf character, really allows you to enable his ability as quickly as possible. There are a number of different effects that we're going to be seeing in this Saga expansion that really starts to kind of spiral out of control, where once you start to get a number of dwarves into play, the effects become more powerful, and it becomes easier and easier for you to get more and more allies and other cards into play. We're going to be discussing another attachment a little bit further on into this video that is perfect to put on Thorin in the early game, so you can commit him to the quest and have him ready again for combat. I think songs would be fantastic on Thorin, just because if he's generating a lot of resources, the more cards that you can fund with those resources, the better overall you're going to be. And of course, as a leadership hero, we could also stick hardy leadership on him to bolster all dwarf characters' hit points by one. And he certainly puts Legacy of Durin to fantastic effect, so he'll generate a lot of resources for you to put a lot of dwarves into play to draw a lot of cards. So overall, I think Thorin, even though he's got a very high threat cost, is really an absolutely fantastic hero. 
One last note I have to mention for Thorin Oakenshield is given not only his intrinsic resource acceleration ability, but also the fact that he possesses a natural resource match for powerful cards like Steward of Gondor, I think it's very likely that at some point during the game, Thorin's controller is likely to find himself with a complete excess of resources, and in a situation like that, I think it's very prudent for that player to consider including a less played card in his deck, such as Parting Gifts, so that given a ton of resources on Thorin, he can redistribute that wealth in a more useful manner, so either to a different hero that he controls that has a more pressing need for resources, or possibly to another player that doesn't have that luxury of resource acceleration. In my own personal experience, that's just been one additional way to squeeze even more utility out of this powerful hero card. As just one final note, I've commented on the art of cards every once in a while, and this is something I didn't actually notice on the physical card, but uh, I think someone pointed out to me, if you look really carefully behind him, you can see Gandalf in the doorway, and I think that that's uh, <laughs> kind of cool and a neat little um, Easter egg, if you will, uh, put in by the artist. So, I happen to mention that Thorin Oakenshield's attack strength is trumped by one hero, and that is Bjorn, a tactics hero with a threat cost of 12. He's got 0 willpower, 5 attack strength, 1 defense value, and 10 hit points. He has traits Bjorning and Warrior, and the keyword Sentinel. He cannot have attachments, and he is immune to player card effects, but Bjorn does not exhaust to defend. So, just like I mentioned, he has the highest printed attack value of any hero in the game by two, and what's really interesting about this character is just like Grimbeorn defending against trolls, he does not have to exhaust to defend, so so long as he doesn't take too much damage, he can defend against any number of attacks with that gigantic pool of hit points. One of the cool things, I suppose, about Bjorn is that his stats total up to 16, and his threat cost is only 12. So while it's hefty, his stats are also hefty. And of course, he's sort of counterbalanced by the fact that you cannot put attachments on him to bolster his defense, uh, and he's immune to player card effects. So the restriction is hefty, but, but I think it makes for a nicely balanced card. Because you can't put attachments on Bjorn, or he's immune to player card effects, and his defense value is so low, there aren't that many attacks that he can defend against without soon piling on the damage. There are a couple of ways to mitigate that, one of which is a lore dwarf ally that we'll be discussing shortly, but another one is a, a card that currently exists, and that is the tactics ally Landreval from the A Journey to Roscoe Bell Adventure Pack. And so Landreval can basically save a hero after the hero card is destroyed and you get to put the hero back into play with one damage token. So that's one way to sort of circumvent Bjorn's restriction and get sort of two lives out of him. And so that can be quite handy. So I think you touched on something very important there, Matthew, when you went ahead and pointed out that Bjorn cannot be the recipient of a host of different healing effects that other powerful defending characters are welcome to take advantage of. The big problem here is that he's immune to player card effects, and he has this ability so long as he remains in play. We've had Caleb Grace rule that the effect Fortune or Fate, because it specifically targets Bjorn while he would be in the discard pile, can actually be used to return him to play. And because Landreval says after a hero card is destroyed, and after that card has been put in the discard pile where presumably it doesn't have any active abilities anymore, then you can bounce him back to your hand to return that hero to play, albeit with one damage token. I think Bjorn can be extremely powerful in the early game if maybe you have a lot more enemies coming off of the encounter deck than you were expecting. So if you contributed a lot of characters to the quest, and then a bunch of enemies came off the encounter deck, instead of taking a ton of really dangerous undefended attacks, his one defense strength can help mitigate the incoming blows a little bit, but that massive pool of hit points can be extremely handy to make sure that you're not losing any heroes right off the bats. 
since we just recently finished the Dwaro Delph cycle of adventure packs, it was so common for goblin followers to come into play, become engaged with the last player, and if that was somebody like myself, where they're a questing and support deck, maybe they don't really have any ready characters to deal with that, so he can kind of contribute his sentinel defending across the table to help out other players as well. That no attachments ability itself is also pretty restrictive, but in some specific cases it actually works out as an advantage to the players. So in the Watcher in the Water, Bjorn can attack those grasping tentacles without any sort of fear that he would be the recipient of a, you know, his attack strength and defense strength are now zero condition attachment. And the same goes with the sack cards that we're going to be seeing in the We Must Away Air Break of Day scenario. We don't like to mention upcoming player cards too much, but I will feel free to spoil an upcoming quest, and that is the first quest in the second Hobbit expansion, Lies and Spiders. The poison cards are considered attachments as well, so Bjorn cannot get poison counters. Really the last thing I have to mention about Bjorn is since you're not able to take advantage of any sort of conventional healing effects, it's really important that you include some sort of shadow cancellation abilities. So whether it's Hasty Stroke or Dunedain Watcher, maybe even Dawn Take You All, you just really want some ability to kind of mitigate the damage piling up on Bjorn. Up next is our spirit hero, who is Nori. Nori's threat cost is 9. 2 willpower, 1 attack strength, 2 defense strength, 4 hit points, he is a dwarf, and his response reads, after you play a dwarf ally from your hand, reduce your threat by 1. So Nori is our second spirit dwarf hero. The first was Dwalin from the Khazad Doom Deluxe expansion, and they're very similar as far as their stats go. They both have a threat cost of 9, and their stats are identical, except the willpower and the attack strength are flipped from Dwalin to Nori. And they both also have an ability that lowers your threat. For Dwalin, of course, it's when he attacks and destroys an orc enemy, you get to lower your threat by two. And then for Nori, it's when a dwarf character enters play from your hand, you get to reduce your threat by one. So very similar effects, and they could be quite potent together if you're playing a quest with a bunch of orcs and playing a bunch of dwarves, your threat will be lowering all of the time which I think really makes either Nori or Dwalin, or perhaps both, a nice complement to either of our leadership dwarves. So I certainly like the fact that Nori does begin the game with a relatively low threat value that can become increasingly low over time. Maybe if players are taking advantage of effects like Legacy of Durin, when they're putting a dwarf character into play, they're not only reducing their threat by one, but they're also drawing a card, potentially to draw another dwarf and put another dwarf into play. What I think is very powerful about this ability is so long as you can play one ally per turn, you can kind of lock your threat at whatever level it happens to be currently sitting at. He certainly isn't the most combat-capable character, but he is a relatively hardy defender, and I certainly enjoy that he's able to contribute three willpower to the quest, again, given that you have Dane Ironfoot on the table. Historically, when I've used Dwalin, he hasn't done very much orc killing, so in my experience with playing mostly two-player games, I think in almost every situation, I would tend to pick Nori over Dwalin. I absolutely agree that Nori is a more consistent source of lowering your threat, though I will say in our progression series, it wasn't uncommon for Dwalin to be killing orcs in lower threat. I did it at least when I was using him, at least once or twice per game, and so a total of four or six, you know, isn't isn't that bad. But certainly I think if you need consistent threat reduction, Nori is probably uh, a better bet. Definitely, especially if you're taking advantage of a lot of different resource acceleration and card advantage type effects. And whereas in my support type deck, Dwalin was mostly wasted, he did just like you pointed out, work pretty well in your more combat-oriented deck. So in the future, if we were to look at a similar sphere setup, maybe Nori would work great for me, and Dwalin would work great for you. I suppose it's just always good to have different options to fit different players' playstyles. 
So the last hero that we're going to cover for this saga expansion that can be used in any scenario is the lore hero Ori. With a threat cost of 8, he has 2 willpower, 2 attack strength, 1 defense, 3 hit points, and is a dwarf. And akin to Thorin Oakenshield, he reads, if you control at least 5 dwarf characters, draw 1 additional card at the beginning of the resource phase. So immediately he jumps out at me as a very powerful questing and combat character for a relatively low threat cost, I guess. Again, with Dane on the table, he's able to commit for three. If you're able to take advantage of any number of readying effects, he can also be attacking for three. He's certainly not the sturdiest defender, but he's a very resilient questing character in that he's very likely to die from any sort of damage to exhausted characters type effect. You know, I think card draw is always nice. While I tend to prefer tactics cards or perhaps leadership, you know, I, I miss it when Mitch's decks in our progression series don't have card draw. Now, Ori's not going to do any good for me if I'm not playing him, but I certainly realize the value of being able to draw extra cards. And in some cases, I think that Ori of the three heroes that allow us to draw extra cards is perhaps the most consistent, just like I think Nori is a bit more consistent than Dwalin. So in other words, we've got Barivor from the core set and Bilbo from our first adventure pack. Bilbo allows card draw for the first player, whereas Barivor you have to exhaust. In this case, all you have to do is control five dwarves. You don't have to be the first player, and you don't have to exhaust a hero to take advantage of the extra card draw. So, again, if you're playing a dwarf deck, which you better be if you're playing Nori or Ori for that matter, I think this is just a fantastic ability that doesn't force you to exhaust or always be the first player. Certainly, if you're playing dwarves, keep in mind that powerhouse cards like Legacy of Durin and Erebor Record Keeper have a natural sphere match with Ori, so those are a couple different effects that would make it extremely easy for you to hit that five dwarf character threshold. And just like we mentioned that Nori is kind of another option for players to consider instead of Dwalin. This provides lore players that aren't interested in playing Biffer a different dwarf hero option. So if they don't need to rely quite so much on resource fixing, they can still have a very potent questing character. His threat value is a little bit higher, but he's also a little bit more capable in a combat situation than Biffer is. And certainly, if players are running Ori alongside Thor and Oakenshield, not only are they drawing a surplus of cards, but they'll have those accelerated resources to help fund putting an entire throng of dwarf characters into play. So for our leadership cards, the first up is Feely, with a cost of 3, 1 willpower, 1 attack strength, one defense strength and two hit points. He is a dwarf, of course, and his response reads, after you play Feely from your hand during the planning phase, search your deck for Keeley and put him into play under your control. Then shuffle your deck. So we're actually going to go a smidge out of order when it comes to our spheres here in that you really can't discuss Keeley or Feely without discussing the other, and in fact, they are identical. So what I love about these characters is that it's basically two dwarves for the price of one. Now, the three is a bit hefty, but again, you're getting two characters for three. This certainly helps you get to five dwarves all the faster. You can pay for one. Like I said, you get two. Beyond that, I'm currently running a tactics spirit deck with one uh, spirit dwarf hero, and so I'll include three copies of Keeley and one copy of Feely in my deck. That way I get access to an extra free ally that I normally couldn't pay for, and I think that that's fantastic as well. When we look at a lot of different cards creating these review videos, sometimes we take into consideration what is the relative power of this card. So something like Boots from Erebor. When you draw this off the top of your deck, you put it into play for free, but it has a very marginal effect. Certainly Feely or Keely by themselves are not the most powerful Dwarven characters, but just like Matthew mentioned, you're drawing one card, but ideally you're able to put two characters into play. And for the cost of three, you're getting the equivalent of four willpower or four attack strength, provided that someone has Dane Ironfoot on the table, whereas if you'd have drawn something like Zigil Minor, for one fewer resource, you're getting 
only one ally that's half as powerful, so only two willpower and two attack. Since they have multiple hit points, that means they're a lot less likely to die from the effects of something like Dark and Dreadful. Given the relative power of some of these heroes and some of the matchups that we've mentioned already, so like Thorin and Ori, both take advantage of that five dwarf threshold, so it would kind of make sense to put those two together. Leadership and lore, it seems like leadership and spirit is a little bit of an odd match. So just like you mentioned, Matthew, running a tactic spirit deck where you have essentially dead copies of Feely included in your deck. I've been in a number of situations where I'm playing leadership and lore and playing some essentially dead copies of a spirit ally in my deck. So under ideal circumstances, you draw the appropriate ally and you're able to get them into play without too much trouble. But if it just so happens that one of these guys gets stuck in your hand, then they're not nearly as powerful. And once you get one on the table, if its counterpart just so happens to die, unless you're able to play the pair multiple times, subsequent plays of one half of this power combo really kind of shows players a diminishing return. Overall, I think they're very powerful. We've seen a host of different effects where the ability becomes more potent the more characters you have, like for Gondor, or Sword That Was Broken, or Faramir, or maybe you're trying to generate resources with We Are Not Idle. And they work very well with a leadership event that we'll cover a little bit later on in this video. So overall, I think these are fantastically powerful characters. You definitely just want to kind of play with how many copies of each you run in your deck. I think as one final note about Feely and Keely is that if players are very concerned about drawing an essentially dead ally that does not have a natural resource match with their deck, for example in a leadership lore deck, if players are concerned about accidentally drawing their copy of the spirit ally Feely and being unable to play that, so long as they have access to a number of lore resources, Running the unique Noldor ally Gildor in Glorian might allow players to rearrange the top of their deck to ensure that that dead ally is part of their deck so that when they play the other half of that dwarf equation, they're able to take full advantage of that powerful response. So, continuing on with our leadership cards, let's take a look at Cram. This is a leadership attachment for a cost of zero, which reads, Attach to a hero, action, discard cram to ready attached hero. This attachment strikes me as a very inexpensive, potentially potent ability to ready an attached hero. Generally, I'm going to be using this on dwarf characters. There aren't a lot of readying effects outside of spirit or lore, and since dwarves so often have extremely high willpower and extremely high attack strength, this is just one additional means for players to take advantage of both of those attributes. Yeah, this card reminds me a lot of the spirit attachment from Shadow and Flame, Miravore. Of course, you don't get quite as many options, but it's another way to ready your heroes without having to use Unexpected Courage, which was only a one of in the core set. So if you only bought one core set and you only have one copy of Unexpected Courage, this is an additional way to sort of get around that. Beyond that, I think it's fantastic in that even though you have to discard it, there are allies that can help you get this right back, such as the Erebor Hammersmith, to get even more uses out of this very handy attachment. I definitely think that Cram is more powerful the earlier in the game that you get it. So maybe on the first turn, if you're wanting to generate a lot of questing progress, uh, many scenarios we're going to end up seeing have one very daunting location that begins the game in the active location slot. So if you're able to slap this on, say, Dane Ironfoot, contribute him to the quest, and then discard Cram to ready Dane, he's able to contribute that additional willpower and then be ready to deal with any enemies that end up coming off of the encounter deck. Another use for this card is maybe in the later game, if you're trying to make a big quest push, or to overcome some gigantic enemy. Whereas, especially if you're playing with Dane, you really want him ready to benefit from that effect, but he's still got that 2 willpower and 3 attack strength. 
A very powerful but somewhat situational use for Cram is if players are running a lore and leadership type deck. And if you're running leadership, there's really no reason not to play the leadership event We Are Not Idle. So if you have Cram on one of your heroes, you can play We Are Not Idle, you can draw a card, and you can exhaust two dwarf characters to put two resources on one lore hero. You can discard Cram off of one of those heroes to ready it, and then you can spend those two lore resources to put an Erebor Hammersmith into play. You can return that Cram to your hand, and then you can play it on your exhausted hero, discard Cram, and then ready them again. So in some ways, you're kind of using that Cram and the We Are Not Idle to get a free dwarf character into play. So, certainly a little bit situational, but considering you want to hit that five dwarf character threshold as quickly as possible, and if you've got effects like Legacy of Durin in play, it's nevertheless a very powerful play. And our final leadership card is an event, a very good tale, which also costs zero just like Cram. Action, exhaust two allies you control to shuffle your deck and discard the top five cards. Put up to two allies discarded by this effect into play under your control. The total cost of allies put into play cannot exceed the total cost of allies exhausted to pay for this effect. So this is a very good card, <laughs> which, you know, I, I think is very fitting given its title. So while A Very Good Tale has a bunch of varied uses, to me the most potent use of this card would be during the refresh phase. I think it's important to remember that refresh is its own distinct phase outside of adding resources or drawing your card for the turn or any of that. And the reason it's important to remember that I think is in part because of the corset version of Gandalf. Gandalf doesn't bounce back to your hand or to your discard pile until the end of the round, and the refresh phase is the final phase of the round. So Gandalf would technically be readied, and then you could play this event during the refresh phase to exhaust Gandalf and perhaps another ally to then put up to two allies from the top five cards of your deck into play. So that's another way to get a very great use out of the five cost Gandalf. I also think this is a great card in conjunction with Keeley and Feely because you get two allies for the price of one, you pay only three, you exhaust them both, you have a total cost of six now that you can spend from the top five cards. So I've not really played with this card in my decks very often because, again, I'm often running tactics, but when my buddies have been doing leadership uh, dwarf decks, this has just been an absolute powerhouse in helping them not only get to five dwarves, but just having a massive little mini army on the table. I think it's extremely fitting that one of the best candidates to tell a very good tale just so happens to be Gandalf, in that that fits with the theme from the book just perfectly. One of the most important things to take into consideration with this card is that it puts allies into play. You're not playing them from your hand. So whereas a Longbeard Orc Slayer, when it enters play, its ability is triggered, is something like Erebor Hammersmith. Its response is dependent on playing it, as opposed to being put into play. Uh, certainly, I think this is an extremely powerful ability, especially if it just so happens to coincide with your playing Gandalf. When played in a more conventional way, this is a little bit of a risk, in that maybe you're exhausting some powerful allies, and maybe you put some less powerful allies into play, although they are ready and capable of being sent to the quest or fighting for you. But certainly, if players are taking advantage of different global readying effects, so whether it's Lure of Moria or something like Grim Resolve, this can just help players to get a host of allies on the table as early as possible. So on to our tactics cards, the first of which is a unique ally named Bofer, which should sound familiar. He's a cost of three with two willpower, two attack, zero defense, and three hit points. He has the dwarf trait, and this version of Bofer has action. Exhaust Bofer to search the top five cards of your deck for one weapon attachment. Add that card to your hand and shuffle the other cards back into your deck. So, the first thing that jumps out to me about this character is that for a tactics ally, he has incredibly high willpower. Three, if you're playing with Dane Ironfoot. He certainly has good attack value. Uh, he's, of course, a little bit more expensive than something like a veteran axe hand, 
but if you're running this character in a tactics deck, it's unlikely that you're using him strictly for that attack value. And if you are using him to commit to the quest, I think with that three hit point value, he's very resilient, he's very formidable, and is very unlikely to die from staging damage. So, Bofer is the Dwarven Tactics version of Master of the Forge. The Master could let you search your top five cards for any attachments, and Bofer is certainly limited to weapons, but Dwarves are at no lack for potent weapons, whether it's the Corset's Dwarven Axe or the Dwarodelf Axe. In addition to the two Dwarven weapons, there are an additional six weapons in the game, and that's counting the treasures that we'll be reviewing later. So eight weapons total in the game, two are Dwarf-centric, three are treasures. But Bofer can help you get any of those. I think for me, the biggest drawback with Bofer is that his spirit version is good as well, and you cannot have two copies of the same unique ally in play at the same time, or I should say unique character if there's a hero and ally version, which we will see in the second Hobbit expansion. But on the one hand, I think that that helps balance out the power of the dwarves, certainly in a multiplayer game, not so much in solo. But if there are two or three people playing dwarves, a lot of the dwarf characters are unique. So in some senses, like I said, it really does balance them out and helps it them from completely overpowering the encounter deck. So I think Bofer is a solid addition to our Tactics Dwarf allies. Just like when we covered the Master of the Forge, this kind of allows Tactics players a little bit of card advantage and that they can dig for attachments. Certainly, if that same player is running Imladris Stargazer, if they're not happy with the top five cards of their deck, this is one way of shuffling that. But really, outside of that situation, this is just one more out of scarcely few ways for Tactics players to add some additional cards to their hands. Up next is a zero-cost Tactics event, Foe Hammer. Response, after a hero you control attacks and destroys an enemy, exhaust a weapon card attached to that hero to draw three cards. So certainly this is going to work very nicely with Bofer, the ally we just discussed, to help you get those weapon cards even faster to trigger the Foe Hammer. And it's finally some pretty potent Tactics card draw. Sadly, at least for me, this is one of those cards that's better in theory than it is in practice. And I know a few of my buddies in my local playgroup feel the same way. There are a lot of conditions that you have to meet in order to get Foe Hammer to go off, like many cards. Uh, one is you have to have a weapon in play. Two, you have to have this in your hand. And then three, you have to be able to attack and destroy an enemy. It often seems like I have Foe Hammer in my hand without any weapons, or I have weapons on the table without foe hammer and i there are very very few times i've been able to pull this off now that's not to say that it's not possible it's just it sounds like it's super cool but it's a little more difficult to pull off than its partner event goblin cleaver that we'll talk about in just a moment so i like foe hammer it's in quite a few of my decks it's just not often that i'm able to pull off its effect because i either don't have a weapon or don't have foe hammer in my hand when i do have a weapon so my overall feelings on this card are somewhat mixed. I certainly think that perhaps one easy way of trying to trigger this is putting weapon attachments on characters that do a lot of attacks. So perhaps Eladan or Boromir. And if it just so happens that you are able to trigger this effect, you could certainly use Hama to kind of recycle this back into your hand so that even though you've got a discard a card to play a card, you're still pulling in a net gain of card draw. One other thing that I think players should keep in mind when considering running Foe Hammer is that one of the very few weapon attachments that we have available to us is Dwarodelf Axe. And for Foe Hammer to trigger, a character has to have a weapon attached to them and attack and destroy an enemy. But if you just so happen to find yourself up against, say, a very high defense strength enemy, if you only need to deal something like one damage, if a character that has Dwarodelf Axe attached to them is able to attack that enemy, but their attack strength is insufficient to surmount that defense strength, Dwarodelf Axe's response can kill that enemy, but then it doesn't count as the hero destroying it. It's kind of an intervening effect, akin to something like Goblin Cleaver that we're going to cover, just wrapped up in an attachment. 
So I would just advise players to watch out for any future effects that are similar to that. So our last tactics card in this saga expansion is Goblin Cleaver, an event with a cost of zero that reads combat action, exhaust a weapon card attached to a hero you control to choose an enemy engaged with you, deal two damage to that enemy, deal three damage instead if the enemy is an orc. So, just like Foe Hammer, this is another free event that takes advantage of weapon attachments being stuck on your characters. I'm a huge fan of direct damage effects like Thalon and Gondorian Spearmen, so personally, if I can overcome enemies via direct damage tricks as opposed to having to suffer attacks from them, and then exhausting characters to attack them, I'm a huge fan. So, cards like this are personally very appealing to me. I sort of think of this card as a mini quick strike in that you get to do some damage before an enemy is striking you. Quick strike might be enough to kill an enemy, especially with a pumped up Gimli or something, and this is only doing two damage, three if it's an orc, but it certainly could finish off an enemy. Maybe one like the Watcher with its very high 7 defense. This is a way to sort of circumvent that. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of direct damage in pretty much any card game. So I think that this is really fantastic and even better against Orcs. Certainly when we were discussing Foe Hammer, you went ahead and pointed out that you're not always going to be finding yourself with weapon cards attached to your heroes but you can certainly increase your chances of that occurring if you're running multiple copies of the Tactics Bofer in your deck. Certainly, this combines perfectly with effects like I already mentioned. So, Thalon damages enemies as they come out of the encounter deck. The enemies end up engaging with you, you damage them, and then maybe you defend with a Gondorian Spearman. You can certainly play effects like Fresh Tracks, multiple copies of Goblin Cleaver, or, like we're going to cover a little bit later in this video, Expecting Mischief. Players can certainly recycle this event with Hama, but the major problem there is if he never gets a chance to attack, you're never going to be able to return this event to your hand. So maybe it's going to be enough to kill enemies outright, Maybe it's going to be enough to soften them up so Hama can end up dealing the finishing blow. And then, really, the only other drawback about this card is if it's Goblin Cleaver killing enemies, then you're never going to have an opportunity to trigger Foe Hammer. Goblin Cleaver and Foe Hammer are very similar effects in many ways, but I think, for me at least, the key distinction is for Foe Hammer, it has the extra condition of not only having a weapon attached, but you have to attack and destroy the enemy. For Goblin Cleaver, all you have to have is a weapon attached. You don't have to do any attacking, you don't have to do any destroying, so having that, you know, the fewer conditions necessary to trigger the card, I think make it even more versatile than Foe Hammer, which uh, makes it much easier to pull off at the end of the day. Really, the only other thing I have to add about this card is particularly against orc enemies, that is a ton of direct damage. And especially combined with any of the effects we've already mentioned, I think this is very likely to be killing some enemies for you. So, taking a look at our remaining two spirit cards, the first of which is Spare Hood and Cloak, an attachment with a cost of zero and the trait item. Attach to a character and action, exhaust Spare Hood and Cloak and exhaust attached character to ready another character. Then, attach Spare Hood and Cloak to that character. So, this strikes me as a repeatable common cause. So, both of those cards are free, but this kind of allows you to toss the Spare Hood and Cloak between characters. So, under ideal circumstances, you've got one character ready at the end of the round with a Spare Hood and Cloak attached to them, and you exhaust them to ready a more useful character. You know, it's funny that you thought of this as related to Common Cause, which I think it is, though Common Cause is hero only, and this can be anyone, hero or ally. I sort of thought of it as the attachment version of Erebor Record Keeper. Erebor Record Keeper, you have to exhaust him, pay a resource, and then ready the hero. Uh, so this is a little more free, uh, or less expensive in that sense. This isn't a card I've seen anyone use, but like with 
any card, if you're building your deck around it, I'm sort of thinking that it could potentially be good. You know, I think in probably almost every single game that we have played in the progression series so far, certainly with me as, as the tactics player, I have someone ready at the end of the round, or at least often I do, because there was nothing to attack, or I had more characters out than there were enemies, or whatever else. So if I've got my Gimli sitting there, no one to attack, you have, you know, a bazillion enemies on your side for whatever reason, I can exhaust my Gimli to ready one of your guys to either do an extra defense or an extra attack. Whereas if we have more of an attacking round than a questing round, then you can return the favor. So... I think it's one of those cards that would take a little bit of effort to get it to work, but if decks are fulfilling different roles, one's sort of really attacking and one's questing or something else, both decks aren't going to be exhausting all of their characters every single round. At least I would think that that wouldn't be the case. So this could turn out to be a quite powerful attachment, but it could also, I think, just as likely be a dud. So it's a card I've never played with, so I think I'd have to experiment with it to really see how potent it can be. I think the major limitation for this card is once you have this stuck to your most valuable character, like in our games, if it is sitting on Gimli, unless we have a host of other readying effects, I really don't see us having a lot of spare actions on our most valuable characters to kind of toss this back to somebody where it might be a little bit more situationally useful. Certainly, if you are running effects like Grim Resolve or Lure of Moria, or you just have a bunch of Unexpected Courage or Ever My Heart Rises loaded up onto one character, they might have the opportunity to take advantage of Spare Hood and Cloak to maybe ready Barivor, have somebody draw some cards, any number of different things like that. It just seems like in all of those situations, this is probably most effective if we already have a bunch of different readying effects. And I think I'm just much more likely to include those other readying effects in my deck as opposed to doing that to facilitate having this as an additional means of doing so. Sure, just like I said with Cram, I think this is another way to get around the fact that Unexpected Courage is a one-of card in the core set. In some cases, uh, Spare Hood is perhaps better than Cram in that it doesn't disappear in that you could bounce it around, and even if you only get one use out of it, uh, or maybe even two, it's two uses out of the same card, whereas Cram had to go to your discard pile, maybe it gets returned back, maybe it doesn't. Again, this isn't a card I've ever played with, I don't think anyone in my playgroup plays with this card, but I can see it being really powerful if decks are built around it. So our final spirit card of this saga expansion is another zero-cost event, Late Adventurer. Quest action. Exhaust a character you control that is not committed to the quest to commit that character to the quest. Much like Spare Hood and Cloak, this is another card that I've not ever used in a deck, and no one in my playgroup has used it either. I don't think it's necessarily a bad card, but as Mitch is so fond of saying, is this something you want taking up a spot in your very precious 50-card deck? Or is this a card that you really are going to want to draw on your turn. In some situations, yeah, I think that, that it could be. In a lot of situations, it may not be. I think perhaps its best use would be a lot of the treacheries that remove characters from the quest. There are a few in Shadow and Flame. I'm thinking of a few in the second Haba expansion that are just infuriating. This is a way around those cards where you can at least get some characters committed back to the quest. But outside of some of those sort of knit situations where treacheries are removing a bunch of characters from the quest. Again, I'm not sure that I want this taking up one of my 50 cards in my deck. I definitely have to agree with you. I think the most conventional use for this card is if you're holding characters back from being committed to the quest because you're expecting a lot of combat to happen. If that doesn't happen, if you've got one or more of these in your hand, you can certainly, after staging, contribute those characters to the quest, maybe make some additional progress. I think the problem starts to occur when... Under most circumstances, it's probably not going to make or break your winning that scenario by committing those additional characters. So sometimes maybe it means you don't gain additional threat, or maybe there's a situation where you have to pay some sort of heavy penalty for not questing successfully. 
maybe another use for this card is a little bit of damage prevention. So if you're concerned about something like a Dark and Dreadful coming off of the encounter deck, maybe you're holding back your healing characters and you don't want them exhausted prior to staging. So if you've got a wounded hero that you're worried about possibly dying, depending on what's revealed off of the encounter deck, you can commit them to the quest after the fact. So they're ready, maybe, when they would have taken damage had they been exhausted. Then you can commit them to the quest, then you can trigger all your healing characters, and maybe you're a little bit safer. I just think that the major problem with this card is I'm much more likely to use something like Lure of Moria or any other global readying effect in that situation, which even though it's far more expensive, it's also way more powerful, and I'm generally a lot happier to draw a card like that. And really, in a single-player game, I feel like it would be a thousand times more useful to draw a card like Hinamarth Riversong off of the top of your deck, just because if you're able to scry the encounter deck, unless there are a ton of surging cards, you know exactly what to expect, so you don't have to do any sort of clumsy, after-the-fact corrective measure. You can just get it right the first time. But on to our lore cards, the first of which is a unique ally named Dory. With a cost of 3, he has 1 willpower, 2 attack strength, 1 defense, and 3 hit points. He has the trait Dwarf and Response. After a hero is assigned any amount of damage, exhaust Dory to place that damage on Dory instead. This is an interesting character. So in the lore sphere, if you're looking for a potent questing character, Erebor Record Keeper is certainly a much more potent willpower alternative. So for the cost of one, you're getting that too, instead of the cost of three. Certainly he's much hardier if you send him to the quest, and if you find yourself in a combat situation, he's actually pretty competent with that three attack value. Again, all of this is presuming that someone has Dane Ironfoot on the table. I guess, what do you think about his ability, Matthew? Well, as I think has been made pretty clear in our progression series video, uh, I have little love for the lore sphere. But interestingly, I like quite a few of the lore cards. In fact, I like all of them in this expansion. The reason I love Dory so much is just like Landerval, it's another way to heal the super cool hero Bjorn. Caleb Grace, the lead designer for the game, has ruled that Dory's ability isn't targeting Bjorn himself, who's immune to player card effects, but it's targeting the damage. Therefore, Dory is, at this point at least, the only way to heal damage, in an, in, or really it's more like stealing damage, from Bjorn. So that's fantastic. So if you've got hardy leadership in play to bump up Dory's hit points to four, maybe you're putting some boots from Erebor or some other sort of hit point boosting attachments onto Dory, he'll be able to soak up quite a bit of damage. You can heal him with some other character or some other effect and, in essence, really extend the life of Bjorn. Really, the major drawback to Dory is, just like so many other allies, in order to trigger his ability, he has to be ready. So he has to exhaust to do his damage intervention effect. So if an enemy attacking Bayorn, for example, was dealt a shadow card that ended up boosting its attack strength to a deadly level, unless Dory is unexhausted and ready to use his ability, you're not going to be able to use that damage intervention effect, which is why I think it's all the more important that players take advantage of those readying effects. So I think Dory is a character that you pretty much are only playing for his ability, which is somewhat of a shame because his stats are decent, but I could make the same argument about Faramir. You really only play Faramir from the core set for his ability, and his stats are also quite reasonable. So while it does sort of suck to have to exhaust him, there are plenty of allies where you must exhaust them to take advantage of their response, and as such, their stats are almost irrelevant. With that said, I think Dory's response is fantastic, especially in conjunction with Bjorn, perhaps less so with other heroes, uh, and I think Dory would be less needed to heal other heroes because they, you're able to boost up their defense or whatever else, and, and as such, you can use Dory's stats. But if you're going to use Bayorn, I think it's really critical to have both Landreval and Dory either in your deck or in your buddy's decks to really take full advantage of our fantastic new tactics hero. 
So for any number of reasons in this game, sometimes it happens that even if you're not expecting one, an undefended attack does happen. Maybe something like a striking tentacle from The Watcher in the Water comes to mind. So in that situation, instead of losing a hero, this is effectively one ally that can absorb undefended attacks for you. Next up for the lore sphere is the attachment Thror's Map with a cost of one. It must attach to a hero, and it's a travel action. Uh, that's uh, another recent errata. Exhaust Thror's Map to choose a location in the staging area. Make that location the active location. If there's another active location, return it to the staging area. While a lot of people think that this card got nerfed and is less potent than it used to be, I do still think it's a nice way to avoid some of those nasty travel effects. And in the Hobbit Saga expansions particularly, there are quite a few locations that you must spend Baggins resources, which we'll talk about in a little bit, to travel there. And that's the only way to travel there. And it can be so frustrating, and you can get uh, location locked very quickly. And so I think Thror's map, at least in certain Hobbit quests, would be very handy to sort of get around that otherwise very restrictive travel effect. Even though this attachment has been significantly reduced in power ever since they amended that to be a travel action, it nevertheless remains a very cheap card to put into play. You mentioned circumventing travel effects. There are also a host of nasty effects while locations sit in the staging area. Or if you just so happen to have a very nasty location stuck in your active slot. I think the perfect example is more Goldwyn. In the Massing at Osgiliath, where characters take damage as they commit to the quest, or maybe Dreadful Gap, which has a number of quest points equal to the number of characters in play, it allows you to swap those out of the active location slot so that you're facing something far more benign. In some very rare cases, it can allow players to repeatedly take advantage of some beneficial effects. I suppose one example that comes to mind is Oakwood Grove during Conflict at the Carrick, where, while it's the active location, you can spend any resources as leadership resources, which allows players a better chance at recruiting that powerful objective ally. Really, the only drawback about this card is I think there are certainly plenty of scenarios where you don't have a lot of really nasty effects on locations, so this wouldn't be that great. And if it just so happens that you do have something hideous as your active location, if you don't have anything sitting in the staging area, then you're not going to be able to do that swap. Yeah, I don't disagree with that too much, except that I still think there are plenty of locations that have nasty travel effects. And so basically what this can do as your travel action, it's basically every turn, since you can only travel to one place anyway, this allows you to get past a lot of those nasty travel effects, like we mentioned. Uh, there's certainly plenty of times we debate traveling, and it's, oh god, I don't want to go to that location because it sucks, so let's go to this lesser threat one just because nothing bad happens. Certainly with the new Nightmare decks that have come out, since we probably won't be reviewing those cards necessarily, I can say that every single location has a horrid travel effect. And I was thinking every time I played through it, like, God, I need Thror's map. And of course, I'm not playing lore, but none of those are locations that you want to travel to. Many of them you either don't want active or don't want in the staging or you just don't want at all. So I think for every turn, not having to deal with the travel effect, providing you're clearing out the active location, that this is still a good card. It's true that you can no longer manage threat the way people used to use it. So if you got a high threat location in the staging area, they would use the action window to switch it out immediately and make it active. You can't do that anymore. But I still think there are plenty of nasty, nasty, nasty travel effects that this card is great at negating. And there aren't that many ways to negate travel effects in this game at all. Our final lore card of this saga expansion is Expecting Mischief, an event with a cost of one that reads, Play during the quest phase before the staging step. Action. Deal two damage to the first enemy revealed from the encounter deck this phase. So, the most interesting aspect of this card is that it's another instance of a little bit of sphere bleeding. So, lore gains a little bit of direct damage, particularly if players are running scrying effects so that they can tell exactly what's coming off of the encounter deck, they can guarantee that this card does not whiff. 
If you know a very big enemy is about to come off the top of the encounter deck, multiple copies of this event can certainly stack to do some very serious damage to large adversaries, completely circumventing defense, and combined with a host of other direct damage effects like we've already mentioned in this video, I feel this can be a fairly reasonable means of dispatching enemies. Yeah, this may be the very first time that I will have said this about a lore card, but I love it. It might as well be a tactics card, which is probably why I love this card. Um, lore is really starting to get some cool stuff. Uh, we'll get to our Heirs of Numenor card review pretty shortly, but uh, we're getting all these cool little traps for the lore sphere that really are messing with enemies as they're coming off the encounter deck. Um, and there promises to be more traps in the upcoming cycle that's attached to Heirs of Numenor. So I'm actually sort of getting excited to maybe run some tactics lore decks, but there are quite a number of enemies. You guys know I, know, I normally total up all the enemies, but uh, we're getting to the point now where uh, LOTR LCG, Mitch and I's go-to source for pulling up card information, isn't updated with Hobbit 2 or Heirs of Numenor. Uh, they do it about six months after a set has released, so my ability to uh, tally up the number of things is, is getting uh, less easy, I should say. So I'll just leave it with there are quite a few enemies in the game that have two or fewer hit points that this would insta-kill, or certainly it does a decent amount of damage all on its own. I love Thalon. This would be great in conjunction with Thalon. I suppose the drawback would be is if Thalon insta-kills bats many times in this game, those dreaded bats and all their different varieties. Then, you know, if the bats were first, Thalon kills them, and then this thing sort of fizzles. So you, you might want to include some sort of scrying effect, as Mitch was mentioning, not only so you don't whiff, but so that you don't aren't doing overkill with your direct damage effects. But otherwise, I think this is a great event. I've not seen anyone use it. I certainly haven't. My playgroup hasn't, but I think you can almost guarantee that I will be trying it out in the progression series at some point. Really, the major consideration for players to take into account before running a card like this is definitely in a single-player game, you want to be running some sort of scrying effect just so you can guarantee that you're not wasting your resources and wasting this card. Certainly, the more players that there are in a game, even with a little bit of scrying, you introduce the possibility of this whiffing. So, just like Matthew and I did when we were playing with Cave Torch, is kind of analyze the makeup of the encounter deck you're up against. So if you're only expecting 25% enemy cards, in a two-player game, it's probably not the best idea to consistently play this blindly. Certainly, the more players there are in the game, the more likely you are to end up drawing an enemy. There are going to be some situations where this is overkill or just not very necessary, like you pointed out in your Thalon example. But overall, I can say I'm excited to try this one. So that brings us to our one and only neutral card for this Saga expansion, a new version of... I am Gandalf, and Gandalf means me! His cost and his stats clock in exactly like the corset version. Five cost, fours all around. He is a course and his starry. Gandalf does not exhaust to commit to the quest, and his forced effect reads, At the end of the refresh phase, discard Gandalf from play. You may raise your threat by two to cancel this effect. So as soon as Gandalf was spoiled and we saw this card, instant debate raged in the community about which version is better, core or Hobbit. And I'm sure Mitch and I, will maybe we can sign off our discussion of this card by saying which one we think is better. But they're very different, right? The first Gandalf it has a variety of things that you can do when he enters play, but he's only pops in for a round or two, which is actually kind of more like he is in The Hobbit than this version of Gandalf, which to me is sort of more like the Lord of the Rings version. But with, with that aside, you get a very powerful character that you can keep around turn after turn so long as you can mitigate that effect. So I think that Gandalf is ideal for low threat hero decks. So maybe Shadow and Flame when you're starting off with zero threat, this would be a great addition. Or if you're using heroes like Dwalin or Nori to try and consistently lower your threat. Uh, I think Song of Arendil may be very helpful to a degree to help mitigate the threat gained from Gandalf. What do you think of this version, Mitch? 
So when I play solo, sometimes I need a more permanent character in play than the core set version of Gandalf is able to provide. So it's always great when he can interplay, maybe do some damage, maybe drop threat, draw cards, commit to the quest, do some defending, do some attacking. But this version of Gandalf, you kind of get to double dip in that you can commit him to the quest with powerful four, and then he's an extremely capable combatant. He's much more reliable in that you can leave him in play turn after turn, and when your threat happens to get too high, if you want, you can just allow him to be discarded and then put another copy of him into play. One of my favorite lore and spirit decks that I like to play takes advantage of the hero's Frodo Baggins, the lore version of Aragorn, and the new spirit version of Glorfindel. It's a deck that starts at very low starting threats, but one area where it really struggles is combat. So this version of Gandalf really helps a spirit and lore deck that struggles to conjure up the massive attack strength that leadership or especially tactics decks can do much more readily. And although he causes very rapid threat gain, in that situation I've got that lore version of Aragorn to trigger his refresh action to once per game drop my threat from whatever it happens to be back down to my starting 24. So before we move on, I just think it's worth noting that just like the core set version of Gandalf, unless you're able to cancel that discard at the end of the round effect, this version of Gandalf also provides players an opportunity to take advantage of him during the refresh phase, but before he actually leaves play. So if you've got something like Word of Command or a very good tale in your hand, that's a perfect opportunity to eke just a little bit more value out of this very powerful ally. Really the only shame about this version of Gandalf is it's nowhere near as friendly to sneak attack as the core set iteration, and in a multiplayer environment, I think a lot of other players might find themselves pretty frustrated if your one unique copy of Gandalf sitting in play the entire game is preventing them from triggering any number of beneficial effects. I have certainly had that happen. <laughs> so Mitch, ultimate question. In answer in one word or less, core or hobbit? Core. Ah, uh, yeah, me too. I thought we might disagree, but I also prefer the core version of Gandalf. Well, before we bring this video to a close, why don't we go ahead and cover a few cards that are exclusive to this series of Saga expansions. The first of which is Bilbo Baggins, a hero of the Baggins Sphere with a threat cost of zero. He has one willpower, one attack, one defense, and three hit points. He has the Hobbit trait, and the first player gains control of Bilbo Baggins. Bilbo Baggins cannot gain resources from player card effects, and if he leaves play, the players lose the game. So Matthew and I could go on and on and on about the countless uses that are very scenario-specific for this hero, but we thought what was most useful is just to discuss a few combos relevant to uh, this version of Bilbo Baggins. Yeah, there isn't much to say about this particular version of the Saga Bilbo. Hobbit 2, that version of Bilbo has a little bit more going on, but what I thought was interesting is that he has one less defense but one more hit point than the lore version that we got in the Shadows of Mirkwood cycle. Otherwise, my only real comments about this version is that he is a candidate for all of the Hobbit attachments in cards we've seen thus far, like Boots of Erebor, Fast Hit, Shortcut, Ring Mail, perhaps even Good Meal. I'm not saying all of those would be good on him necessarily, but because he is a hobbit, he could take advantage of quite a few effects already in the game. But really, I think the only thing worth mentioning, and this is really more quest-specific, is if you haven't played the Hobbit quest and you're listening to this review video first, is you really need to hoard those bag and resources. They are quite potent, though they can also help you pay for neutral cards such as Gandalf. Really, the only other thing I have to mention about Bilbo Baggins is that he counts as one more character under your control. So whether you're attacking with him and benefiting from the effects of Four Gondor, or questing, and he's gaining additional willpower from Faramir or Sword That Was Broken, or even if he's being exhausted to pay for the likes of Hail of Stones, he can nevertheless contribute that little additional effect for the players. 
And really, the only other thing to mention is that he prevents players from running the existing lore version of Bilbo Baggins. So our final player card for the Saga expansion is Burglar Baggins, which also belongs to the Baggins Sphere and costs one. Action, Bilbo Baggins gets plus two willpower, attack strength, and defense strength until the end of the phase. You may spend a Baggins resource from Bilbo Baggins' resource pool to play this card even if you don't control Bilbo Baggins. So this card obviously significantly increases Bilbo's stats from sort of a meager one across the board to a pretty potent three across the board. It's nice that anyone can play this, so if Mitch and I are playing in the progression series and this is in my deck, but Mitch happens to be the first player and has control of Bilbo, I can still play this event from my hand, provided Bilbo has a resource. This isn't a card, again, I've seen anyone use, but I really think this would be far more potent in the second Hobbit Saga expansion quests, where it's really critical, in many cases, for Bilbo to have higher stats. In the three quests in this Hobbit Saga expansion, I'm not so sure that it's absolutely critical for Bilbo to have boosted stats, but it's certainly a great card. It's just, again, is this something you want taking up a space in your deck? My entire playgroup, the answer has been no, but I can certainly see this being beneficial. To me, the major drawback about this card is even though it does act as Durin's song that's exclusive to Bilbo, is that it eats up those precious Baggins resources. And even though it is possible to play Good Meal on this version of Bilbo Baggins and play this event for free, you really have to ask yourself, is it worth all of that trouble? And to me, it's generally not. It certainly could be a little bit of a lifesaver if you're using Bilbo in a defensive capacity, and there's really only one situation where you would ever want to consider doing that. And that's with the first of our three treasure cards introduced in this Saga expansion, which is Sting. So, for a cost of zero, this is unique, it is an artifact, an item, and a weapon. And it reads, attached to Bilbo Baggins, restricted. Bilbo Baggins gets plus one willpower, plus one attack, and plus one defense. And response, after Bilbo Baggins exhausts to defend, discard the top card of the encounter deck. Deal damage to the attacking enemy equal to the discarded card's threat. So, whenever players choose to defend with this version of Bilbo Baggins, they risk him dying and therefore losing the scenario. Though, if he's got two defense and three hit points, he's a reasonable defender, and certainly he can be bolstered by any number of defense-increasing effects, like Ringmail, or Dunedain Signal, or Arwen Undomiel, and if players are taking advantage of scrying effects, they can pretty consistently deal some absolutely massive damage to attacking enemies. So I think that situationally this is going to be fantastic. It certainly combos extraordinarily well with cards like Thalin or Expecting Mischief. And so long as players are able to put a little bit of effort into pulling this off, it can be a very powerful, very consistent defensive effect. Yeah, I think the only thing I have to add is this is just another way to thin the encounter deck. So even if you don't care if the card revealed has a threat value, it's just one more way to discard a card from the encounter deck, whether it does damage to the enemy or not. So to wrap up our card review of our first Saga expansion, we have Glamdring and Orcrist. They're very similar, and they're both zero cost. They are both artifacts, items, and weapons. They both have to attach to a hero, and they're restricted, although Glamdring has the addition in that he could be attached to Gandalf. Both attached characters would get plus two attack strength. And then they have different responses. Glamdring, after it destroys an orc enemy, you get to draw a card. And for Orcrist, after the attached hero destroys an orc enemy, you get to add one resource to that hero's resource pool. So for me, I prefer Glamdring just because as the tactics player, card draw is sort of at a premium, and this allows me to draw a card. Not that resources aren't, but with Horn of Gondor or some other resource generation effects, I'm typically wanting to draw a card, and this is a nice, consistent way to do so. I definitely think that either of these treasures, once you manage to acquire them, are very potent attack power boosts. It's very thematic and very fun that they're free. Just like you, I do tend to prefer card draw a little bit more than resource acceleration, but if you're already running a host of card advantage effects, 
maybe Orcrist isn't the worst choice. And since only one copy of each of these cards can be in play at any given time, you can certainly distribute these amongst the players in order to ensure the best benefits. Yeah, the only drawback to these fantastic treasure cards is there are only two out of the six Hobbit quests that deal with orcs, or have orcs as enemies. The second quest in the first Hobbit box, and the third quest in the second Hobbit box. So you're not really getting your bang for the buck all that often, but I'm never going to pass up uh, an additional two attack strength. Really, the only other thing to mention about these cards is I think they work spectacularly well with the new tactics events we've seen in this expansion, Foe Hammer and Goblin Cleaver, and they certainly work best on probably either ranged characters or characters that have a lot of attacks, so perhaps Eladan or Boromir. But with luck hopefully on our side, I'm very much looking forward to giving these cards a spin. Well, I think that concludes the first of our Saga expansions, so Matthew, any overall impressions about the strengths or weaknesses about some of these cards? You know, as far as I'm concerned, I think this is the strongest entry into the game thus far. Almost every card is very useful, very powerful. Spirit a little bit less, though, than some of the others, but I wouldn't be surprised if any or all of these cards show up in our progression series at one point or another. It just really is a great addition to the game. I was so excited for this set. The quests are, are also very fun, very thematic. I'm looking forward to those. I couldn't be happier with this expansion. I definitely have to agree with you that I think this Saga expansion introduces just a host of extremely powerful new options for players to consider in deck building. I think the heroes in particular all add captivating new possibilities for players, the allies without exception are all very powerful, and just like you mentioned, even though the spirit cards in this pack don't really do it for me. I'm nevertheless very excited to try out almost all of these cards. So insofar as player cards go, unless someone's extremely averse to dwarf decks, I think this is just fantastic. Well, thanks so much for sticking through to the end of this somewhat long uh, player card review. As always, if you liked our video, be sure to leave us some comments below. Feel free to subscribe so you never miss any of our exciting content. Next up is We Must Away Air Break of Day, and until then, take care.